dyeing your own fibre is a great way of making really unique yarns. But one of the things you might have come across as you're doing your research is should you go down the natural dye route or the synthetic dye route? So in this video, I'm going to be looking at the pros and cons of both dye types and how it applies to fibre artists. If you're new here, my name's Becca and I'm a hand spinner, knitter and Nibi weaver and you're very welcome to my home in West Wales. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to do in this episode was really just explore what the different options are. And I'm going to be talking predominantly about dyeing with wool. So you've probably come across the term acid dyes. So I am really talking about acid dyes, which is what you would use to dye wool with if you're using synthetic dyes. So having said that, there are kind of there are other dyes. So if you dye um, cotton or well, basically any cellulose fibre, so cotton or linen or rayon or something like that, then you have to use a different type of dye. So I'm just going to restrict myself to what I know, which is working with wool. So I will uh, predominantly be talking about that. OK, so what do we mean by a synthetic dye? Up until the middle of the 19th century, all dyes were natural and they came from animals and plants and minerals and anything that you could sort of find in the natural environment. In 1856, the coal tar process was invented and that was using coal tar, which is sort of a waste product from making gas out of coal. Uh, so it was kind of fairly murky, stinky stuff. They were looking for a way of creating quinine and quinine is used or was used to treat malaria. And we sort of go back to the good old British Empire because it was a huge problem for the British Empire and Brits abroad that they were getting malaria. So uh, we had to take quinine to stop getting malaria and it was expensive to make. And so they were trying to find an alternative to it and ended up discovering that they could make dyes not a chemist, no idea how they did it, but anyway, that's sort of the history of it. And so what had been a very big industry of the natural dye industry, because there was nothing else, so growing indigo, madder, um, processing it, I mean, massive, massive industry, within sort of 50 years had been completely wiped out and completely destroyed because this really cheap chemical way of making pigments and colours had been developed and it just overtook it. So what are the pros and cons of it? OK, so I think quite often kind of old hippies like me will tell you uh, natural dyes are better because they don't use petrol chemicals. And that certainly is true. They don't. However, it is a little more nuanced than that. Just because something is natural does not mean that it's not toxic. Um, you can't poison yourself with it and it doesn't have an environmental impact. So I think you just have to be a little bit careful at saying, oh, natural dyes good, synthetic dyes bad, because it really is not as straightforward as that. So I'm assuming that you're working in your kitchen or if you're not working in your kitchen, then you've got a studio, but it's quite a small space. So you've not got kind of great big vats where you can do a great big amount of dyeing. So I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of natural dyeing to start with. So one of the biggest pros has to be that it's widely available. You can literally walk out your front door, pick something off the side of the road and I'm going to talk about what I was doing this week in a moment and show you what I just picked off the side of the road and you can make dye out of it. It doesn't have to be expensive. You are going to have to take a few safety precautions such as only dyeing with plants and substances that you know to be safe. And I can't emphasise this enough. There are plenty of wild plants and cultivated plants that we have in our environment. And if you put them in your kitchen, you can potentially poison yourself with them. So just bear that in mind. Right. OK, safety warning over. And also uh, very important to say, if you are doing this in your kitchen, don't use your kitchen pots. Make sure you have completely different equipment for your dyeing than what you make your dinner in. And 
all my pots came from secondhand shops and charity shops and I didn't spend a lot of money on them but really really just you know kind of be a little bit sensible okay so the majority of natural dyes are going to need a mordant and when we say a mordant uh, it's a chemical process to make the colour stick to the wool so okay so this is wool here undyed and if you looked under this under an electron microscope you would see that it has little scales and most of the time they're lying flat so if you use a mordant what you're doing is you're just lifting those scales on a very kind of minute basis it's a bit like um, preparing to paint something so if you've got a kind of I don't know a window siddle to paint or something you rub it down to key the surface so by using mordant you're keying the surface of the fibres so that the dye will stick to them now you may also have heard of dyeing with soy milk um, I don't have a lot of experience with it I don't think it's particularly effective and there is a whole other kind of world of problems around production of soy and it doesn't particularly work on wool I don't think people quite often use it with cotton however if that is something that you want to do that is a different method that is a protein dye and so it's actually or a protein mordant so it's making the um, the fibres sticky enough for the dye whatever it is that you're using to stick to it but if you're using a chemical mordant, and I'll talk about a couple of those in a moment, then you are keying the surface, if you like. So imagine you're painting, you rub it down. That's what you're doing with this and a chemical mordant. Now, I say chemical mordant, you go, oh, chemicals. Not all chemicals are going to be dangerous. And what you use for natural dyeing are predominantly a chemical called alum, and for wool it's alum sulfate and it's a pretty benign chemical it's used in deodorants and um, natural deodorants that is not um, not the kind of stuff you get in spray cans and it's used for shrinking cotton and it's been widely used for many 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 centuries it is potentially dangerous if you breathe it in so when you are dealing with it it's in the powder form so just make sure you're wearing a face mask so that you're not breathing it in once it's in solution you don't want to be drinking the stuff it's not going to kill you but it might kind of make you pretty unwell so if you look at the packet that you get it in and you can buy it very easily online then it's going to have the health warnings on and those health warnings are basically don't get it in your eyes don't breathe it in and don't drink it because they're going to be irritants which obviously not a good thing if you unfortunately do get these things in your eye or you breathe it in then obviously seek medical advice okay safety warning over so the other mordants that you can use for natural dyeing are tannins and they're naturally occurring and if you don't want to buy something like alum sulfate tannin is a really good a really good one to use because you can actually extract it yourself uh, it comes in oak leaves and also well, all sorts of things have tannin tea coffee tannins in all sorts of things so that could be an option for you then copper is a very commonly used one copper is poisonous so when you're using it be careful with it then iron iron sulfate uh, you can make your own using rusty nails and things in uh, in a sort of solution of vinegar and that will create a mordant for you there are also tin and chrome which were used quite extensively if you read older books sort of published in the 1970s People do talk about using them. I personally think that they are not something I want in my home. They are quite poisonous and I just don't want to work with them. So I, I really wouldn't recommend them. They do have their advantages so that you can get lots of different colours. And obviously it's up to you if you're happy to use them and you feel that you've got a space that you can work in that's safe, fine. But it's not something I want in my kitchen. It's where I do the majority of my dyeing so I just don't use them so 
What are other things that we can use? Okay, we can also use oxalic acid and oxalic acid is naturally occurring in things like rhubarb and dock leaves. And so you can make your own oxalic acid. It is quite poisonous and anybody that grows rhubarb will know that you don't eat the leaves or the base of the rhubarb because it's such a high concentration of oxalic acid that you can make yourself very, very ill. And in fact, there are cases where people have died from oxalic acid poisoning. So again, use it with caution. The other thing you can do is just use vinegar. There are some dye stuffs that work really well with white vinegar that you buy in your local supermarket. And you know, it is a really good way of just, again, we're lifting the little scales on our fibres so that the colour attaches to them. Okay, so that feels like a lot of talking about mordants, but it is quite a big part of natural dyeing. And that really sort of is one of the disadvantages of using natural dyes, is that it's quite a long process. So you take your raw fibre. I mean, this has actually been, this is comb top, so this has actually been scoured. But even when you're buying comb top, to work with you need to scour it which means that you put it in big pan of cold water bit of detergent in it bring it up to simmering point simmer it for maybe 10 minutes let it cool rinse it and then you know there's no grease in it you can buy specialist scouring liquids that you know people charge you quite a lot of money for just use washing up liquid it's only detergent and I was taught fibre preparation by a woman who took raw fleeces and processed them for people. And she had a great big top loading washing machine, which she used as a boiler. And she literally used the cheapest, cheapest washing up liquid you could buy. And it worked perfectly well. As an aside, if you ever find yourself in West Wales, then there is the Woolen Museum, which is free to go in because it's a museum of Wales. And they have a great big Victorian boiler. And the way they used to scour their wool was to put it in this massive boiler with just washing soda. And that's how they did it. As long as you're not agitating the wool, you're not going to felt it. Um, I think I might be slightly hesitant to do that with washing soda with something like very fine merino. But, you know, you kind of your average your average wools that um, you're spinning all the time, you're probably not going to do them any damage. So you're scouring them. Long process, got to let them cool because you don't want to be kind of pulling your wool in and out of hot water and going into cold water because you're felting. You've got to just be a little bit patient and let it all cool down. So your next stage is going to be your mordanting. And for the last, hmm, how long have I been natural dyeing? Hmm, yeah, quite a long time. 30 odd years I've been doing hot mordanting so that's a hot water making up a solution of my mordant putting it in cold water bringing it up to simmering point simmering for an hour turning it off letting it cool down and then dying with the with the mordanted wool however this week I tried a cold water process and I'm going to show you the results in a minute yeah, I, I think that I may be um, I may be converted to it. So anyway, that was an aside. So, yeah, so we've mordanted it. And quite often what natural dyers will do is do a big batch of mordanting using the alum sulfate, let them dry because they've then got a ready supply of fibre ready to be dyed and ready to go in the dye pot without having to go through that process every time they want to dye. OK, so synthetic dyes, acid dyes, you don't need to mordant them. Make sure your wool is clean. Make up your dye solution, pop your wool in. Whatever the instructions say on the packet, do that. So generally you need um, white vinegar and heat to set the dyes and you basically follow the instructions <laughs> and take your wool out and you've got clear water which you can pop down the drain it is so simple. And these days, anything that you're buying on the high street or online is going to be non-toxic because they have to be. OK, back in the day, they probably were quite toxic. But these days, because 
the dies have been specifically developed for the home market, then then they're just they're not toxic and they are pretty easy to use. You do have to be careful that you're not inhaling them. That's the only thing I would say is that you know you want to make sure you've got a mask on when you're actually making up the dye solutions. And when you're cooking it, you do not want to be breathing in the fumes. But certainly I've got friends who used to bundle up their fibre in Ziploc bags and put it in the dishwasher. Okay, so colours. Synthetic dyes, acid dyes, literally you can create every single colour that has ever been invented <laughs> just by kind of working out some recipes and you can create it and it's completely repeatable. You can write the recipe down, you know how much dye solution you've used with each thing, so you can repeat those colours again and again and again, which is why it's so incredibly attractive to the commercial world, to textile industries, well, to any industry, any piece of coloured printing or ceramics or anything, it's repeatable. And that really is why it's so incredibly attractive to the world at large. As a dyer, you probably do want to be able to repeat it. And if you're somebody that is wanting to have a creative business around your dyeing, actually being able to recreate fantastic colour combinations or a wonderful colour that you just love and sells really well for you, there's a lot of attraction to that. So colours with natural dyes, yes, you can create every colour under the rainbow, but you're going to have to work a little bit harder at it. And the, mm, okay, so your water source is going to make a difference. The plants growing are going to make a difference. Um, you know, you, you're not always going to get the same colours. You get similar colours and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So it's not as reliable as actually mixing up some powders and creating a colour that you know is always going to be there. Having said all that, I think that natural dyeing is great fun. And if you're somebody that maybe is homeschooling or you've got the grandkids for the holidays, you know, setting up a dye kitchen, doing a bit of natural dyeing, fantastic fun, right? Because you are you could learn about history, you can learn about the plants, you can learn about weights and measures, you know, it's a really good fun thing to do. But if you're somebody who wants to create the same colour over and over, over again, it potentially is not as good for you. So you can, you are the only person who's going to be able to say whether that's right or wrong for you. Now, from a personal point of view, I kind of I've been sitting on the fence about whether I'm only going to be doing natural dyeing or I'm going to be adding in a little bit of um, acid dyeing, which is basically what I've been doing for the last few years. And one of my biggest bugbears is not being able to produce a good blue, a good light fast and wash fast blue without having to do quite a sort of complex um, kind of fermentation and kind of messiness and things that I don't particularly want to do in my small space, in my garden and kind of in my kitchen. So I, I've said it in other videos and I think it is the case that I'm kind of, yeah, I'm going to say 90% of my dyeing is going to be natural dyeing, but I... I want to hold on to those acid dyes because they are so useful and I don't want to create an indigo vat in my kitchen and I don't have a garage or a studio anywhere else where I can do it. So that's my personal take on it. Obviously you're going to have a personal taste on it and I personally don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this and I also don't think there's a right or wrong answer on the sustainability side. One of the big appeals of natural dyeing is its sustainability and it most definitely is on a global scale potentially more sustainable than a chemical process. I say that. However, sustainability doesn't have one right answer and me using a little bit of Ashford's um, acid dyes to get a blue, 
I feel I'm being more sustainable because I haven't taken an airline flight for nearly 20 years. Using a bit of acid dye, I think that's okay. And, you know, I'm wearing clothes that I haven't actually dyed this myself. I didn't make this myself. So I'm sort of still consuming things. So I think it's very tempting to be polarised about kind of, oh, na natural dyeing, it's the only thing to do, it's sustainable. Yes, but if you're using a mordant, somebody has mined that, they've processed it, they've put it in a bag, they've shipped it around the world, so it still has a carbon footprint. And my personal opinion is that we should be looking at our carbon footprints in the whole everything that we're doing rather than kind of picking out one thing and kind of saying that's good don't do that do this only do this i think you kind of go okay i'm going to be a little bit pragmatic about this it is not practical for me to do indigo dyeing it just isn't so therefore i'm going to use a synthetic dye when i want to dye something blue Obviously, you are entitled to your own opinion. That's my opinion. This is my YouTube channel. <laughs> okay, so that was an awful lot of talking. So I'm going to take a breath and we're just going to go and have a breath of fresh air. And today we are going to the old fort at Fishguard. And then in part two, I'm going to give you a couple of resources and show you the results of the experiments that I've been working with. We're looking over towards Dina's head there. And we quite often walk over there. I'll take you there sometime. But here we go. This is it. Gosh, it is so wet. It has rained so much this year. I mean, I've said this before. If somebody who lives in Wales tells you it's wet, then you know it's been raining an awful lot. Ah, so we've got more wildflowers just starting at Sea Campion. I actually grow that in the garden. Uh, it's so pretty. There's going to be many more wildflowers as the weeks go on and I will show you more and more as, um, as they come into flower. I hope you enjoyed your little breath of fresh air and so let's go back to dying. Now I've got a couple of resources for you. Now, in my last video, I did actually mention this book, Colour and Spinning. And the problem with this book is that it's out of print, difficult to find and very expensive. If you can find a copy that's even halfway decent, that's not sort of 70 quid, then really pick it up because the information in here is phenomenal. And you've even got sort of recipe charts and just methods. It is really amazing. I have done a little bit of research and I was really struggling to come up with anything that I thought was kind of anywhere close to this. And then I remembered something. Long Thread Media have a membership, a, I think it's around about the 15 pounds, $15, something around that. And you get the magazine, whichever magazine you choose, um, I get Spin Off magazine. And they also have a really good, selection of courses that are I think courses that were recorded for Interweave because this was published by Interweave, Interweave Press who of course don't exist anymore but I'm pretty sure that Long Thread Media came out of um, a lot of or I don't know came out of that's not really the right word but uh, people that work for um, for Interweave went on to form Long, uh, Long Thread Media I think and there are quite a lot of their digital assets, as in courses, that they've held on to or they bought or anyway. If you get the digital membership, 
which I'm pretty sure is around about the £15 mark, but I will leave a link um, in the description below. There is a course that is run by Deb Mems and it is all about dying at home. So if you don't want to spend 70 quid on this book, then maybe just check out that course that's on the Long Thread Media membership. Now, the other resource I'm going to talk about is Wild Colour by Jenny Dean. And Jenny Dean has been natural dyeing for about 30 years. And this is a revised edition because she originally, I've, I've done this again. I'm sitting here with books, I haven't got my glasses on. I can't actually see when it was published. Um, okay, so first published in 1999 and it was, um, it's been revised and this is the 2018 edition. I have to say, I think this is brilliant. And I've got quite a lot of natural dyeing books and I've read quite a lot about it because it kind of is one of the things I'm really interested in. But I have to say, I think this is the best book I've read on the subject and I've only just bought it. And I was saying to you that I'd sort of been experimenting with cold monitoring. That was actually a tip out of this book. So I was like, oh, I'm going to give this a try. So cold mordanted. That is undyed and these two is my dyeing I've been doing this week and that was using a cold mordant of alum sulfate and yeah it worked. It was brilliant. So what you do is you make up your solution and it's a 10% solution, 10% solution. Again let's think about this in a way that actually makes sense. It makes sense in my head, but I realise I'm talking to you. I, it has to make sense. Okay, so you weigh your fibre and this was 100 grams of fibre. Then you need 10% of the alum sulfate powder in the solution to make your mordant. So 100 grams of fibre, 10 grams of mordant. Then make it up into solution Put it in a big vat of cold water, pop in your undyed um, fibre and then let it sit for 12 hours. I was sceptical. I have to say, I thought, ah, this is not going to work. You need the, the heat to, to activate it. Not at all. Look at those colours. Look at those colours. It's really worked. OK, so very quickly, this is dandelion flowers with the sepals so I literally just picked off the dandelion flowers with the green bits attached and this is a mixture and this was another tip from the book is that if you haven't got enough of one colour or one plant that gives you one colour mix them together so this is a mixture of some daffodils that were fading so I bought some cut flowers bought some daffodils and they were going over, they were starting to sort of wilt, but they still had the colour. And that was the whole kind of stalk and all. Some gorse flowers that I just picked off when I was on my walk and some dandelion flowers. And what a fab colour. So there you go. Pretty pleased with those. So I think I would highly recommend experimenting and I would also highly recommend this book. And I will leave links to both these books in the description below and I will actually make them Amazon affiliate links. I am so bad at doing this YouTube thing, <laughs> you know, kind of like, oh yeah, if I put an Amazon link on, people can buy it and I get a percentage. <laughs> oh, hello, wake up. Come on, Rebecca. Yes, yeah, so I'll actually put, an, I'll actually put an, a link in so that um, if you do feel that you would like to buy them and you're kind enough that you buy them through my link, I will, of course, get a little percentage. It's not very much. It really isn't very much. But hey, you know, why not? OK, so I'm going to leave this episode here. Awful lot of talking. And so I think next week we better do a bit of spinning again. I did put a question on the community post just asking what people would like to see over the next few weeks. Quite a few people have asked me about spindle spinning. I am not a spindle spinner. 
Uh, I learnt how to use a drop spindle when I was very first learning to spin. I probably haven't picked one up since then. No, that's a lie. I picked it up, looked at it and went, yeah, no, I'm going to put that away and use my wheel. So, sorry, I really can't advise you on spindle spinning, but I know that Lisa, the soulful spinner, I know she is a spindle spinner and I'm pretty sure that um, Evie, as in the Gillian Eve channel, I'm pretty sure she's a spindle spinner as well. So those probably are your best bets for spindle spinning. I've got a couple of other questions about uh, various things that I do do. So I'm quite happy to um, talk about those and do some demonstrations. I do not feel that I want to attempt to demonstrate things that I just don't do because I don't think that's a particularly honest thing to do. And I would rather be upfront with you and say, don't know how to do it. Not going to even attempt to try and show you. So, OK, so that will be the next thing. Uh, what's the other thing? Oh, yes. So uh, lots of people signed up for my newsletter. That was really fantastic. Thank you very much. And I think I managed to get the technology to work. And so it went out and yes, people opened it. So hurrah, I seem to have managed to work out that. I mean, it's not that difficult. It's just that, you know, kind of I haven't I haven't really done it that much. So uh, I definitely do make mistakes occasionally, but I think I'm getting there with it. OK, so other thing, YouTube. What's happening with YouTube? Uh, ah, dog's barking. Be quiet, dog. OK, YouTube. So YouTube really was just this whim that I started uh, back in, I think, it, oh, I can't remember when it was, some, sometime last year. And I was just playing around with it and I was a bit disillusioned with uh, what I was doing for my um, my shop, that I, uh, my little Zazzle shop that I run. And I just thought, oh, this looks like fun and maybe I can, you know, kind of do this. And <laughs> it turns out, yes, I can do this and I really enjoy it. So big thank you. If you have subscribed recently, I seem to have quite a lot of new subscribers. So welcome. Uh, it's lovely for you to come along here and um, hang out with me. Uh, what's happened in YouTube world is I've reached another milestone. So in the kind of back end of YouTube, it tells you how many subscribers you have and how many views you've got and a thing called watch hours. So basically how many hours people have watched your videos for. And at 3000 watch hours, something happens. It's not a very exciting thing, but it, it, a thing happens. So you can add a membership, which I'm pretty sure I'm not going to do, but you can add a membership. You can add a shop. I might do that at some point, not doing it at this point. And then people can send you stickers, which I think is like tips or I think, I don't know, I've never done it. Do you do it? Um, do you send people stickers, sort of thank you stickers? Anyway, that happens at 3000 hours. Uh, I have just got there on kind of one lot of analytics, but it takes a couple of weeks for the kind of the rest of YouTube to catch up and for them to verify them to say, oh, yes, they are genuine uh, watch hours. And here you go. You've passed that little milestone and people can send you stickers. So, OK, anyway, so I've reached my 3000 watch hours in the kind of the unverified version. So maybe when you're seeing this, it will have been verified. I don't know. Anyway, so that, but that was, you know, that was exciting. And um yeah, I'm really, I'm really chuffed and I'm delighted that you come along here and watch me rabbit on about wool because, you know, I, I hope you can tell it's my passion. And uh, if I'd started YouTube with the idea that I was going to somehow make millions and millions of pounds, I probably would be reviewing tech or kind of what's the other thing that makes lots of money on YouTube? I don't know. Anyway. It's my passion. That's why I'm talking about it. I really enjoy it. And thank you so much for coming along. OK, and very, very finally, 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 I have also been putting out another video recently. Sort of. So I'm doing two videos a week, this sort of podcasty style one and then more of a kind of vloggy or how to video. And this week I've been experimenting with recording a weekly vlog. So I've been taking little snippets each day of the various things that I'm doing. So I will try and edit that together in some kind of coherent, oh, easy for me to say, coherent way. <laughs> 
trust me to trip up that on that word uh, so a coherent sort of storyline so it's not just random bits kind of stuck together but you can actually see the kind of the rhythm of my week because it's been quite a busy week I've been making bacon I've been doing the dyeing um, I have to go and get the car serviced uh, Andrew and I went and did um, sort of walking and photography well Andrew did photography I did walking the dog so um, I'll try and put that together in a video and that probably will be out maybe Monday maybe Tuesday so and as ever this video style or this style of video will be out next week either Friday or Saturday and it is quite dependent on the other things that I'm doing in the week because you know it's my hobby it basically is my hobby um, and I've talked far too long today so until next time my friend happy creating <laughs>